Hi folks, something a bit different for this video. Nothing political or too serious, though I will deal with what one author called the most important question in science fiction, so stay tuned for that. To my small but awesome group of subscribers, don't worry, I plan to keep making more serious videos, but I also want to change it up and branch out a bit. In this video, I would like to talk about one of the many problems with Return of the Jedi. When watching this film as an adult, I find myself thinking a lot of things. First, of course, I think Empire Strikes Back is so much better. Jedi is really the worst of the original trilogy. It's not terrible like the prequels, but it does have a lot of problems. You have your moments. Not many of them, but you do have them. Second, I think that Luke Skywalker's plan to rescue Han from Jabba the Hutt makes absolutely no sense. A lot of people have pointed this out recently. A series of articles on Uproxx, Nerdist, and AV Club have dealt with how little sense this plan makes. Here, I will attempt to do the impossible and make sense of it. Now, I won't argue the plan itself makes any sense as a means of rescuing Han Solo, because it doesn't. Instead, I will offer two explanations for why George Lucas and Lawrence Kasdan decided to write this the way they did. The plan makes some sense if you look at it through an archetypical lens and realize the biblical allusions in it. It seems a lot of people have an interest in hearing about this kind of thing lately, so I figured I would provide a way for people to access this perspective without having to listen to someone with reactionary politics and paranoid conspiracy theories. <coughs> Jordan Peterson. If people like it, I will do more videos like this. Anyway, Jedi is heavy on biblical allusions. Not just the scenes in the throne room, which Lucas has admitted he had Jesus' temptation in the desert in mind when he wrote them, but as you will see, in Jabba's palace as well. As I stated earlier, lots of fans have noticed that this plan does not make any practical sense. Why doesn't Luke just go to Jabba's palace with Lando, Chewie, Leia, and maybe even a whole squadron of rebels to rescue Han? Han is a rebel general, after all. Why does Luke send the droids first? Why does Leia go there and give Chewie to Jabba? If they wanted to sneak Han out, they could have had Lando, who had already infiltrated the palace, do it. How are they planning on freeing Chewie with a blind Han in tow? Or the droids, for that matter. Why does Luke show up with no lightsaber and instead give it to R2? Given the ease with which he sneaks into Jabba's palace, he could have easily snuck in with his lightsaber, rescued Han, and fended off Jabba's goons with the help of Lando, Chewie, and Leia. This is essentially what he does later on, but from a much less advantaged position. Why does he seem to purposely get everyone except Lando captured? Does he just want the theatrics of escaping his own execution? I could probably go on, and knowing Star Wars fans, I'm sure people will point out some more problems I missed in the comments. But, I think you get the point. It made no sense for Luke to get everyone captured. One way to make sense of this plan is in comparison to one of the parables in the Gospel. In the three synoptic Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which for the most part consist of different versions of the same stories, we see the parable of the tenants. I will paraphrase here. The landlord of a vineyard sends some of his servants to collect the fruit from his tenants, which serves as their rent. These tenants kill one servant, beat another, and stone the third. So the landlord sends more servants to collect the rent, and the tenants treat them the same way. Finally, the landlord sends his son, thinking they will respect him. However, the tenants, thinking they will inherit the vineyard if the landlord has no heir, decide to kill the son. Jesus points out that when the landlord himself eventually shows up, he will kill the tenants and give the land to the others. We see an incredibly similar pattern in Return of the Jedi. Luke sends R2 and 3PO to Jabba as a gift, along with a message that he would like to make a deal to free Han. Instead of accepting this offer, Jabba just takes the droids. Then Leia comes to sneak Han out disguised as a bounty hunter, offering up Chewbacca, and she gets enslaved. Finally, Luke shows up. Much like the son in the parable of the tenants, Jabba tries to kill him, thinking that if he does, he can just keep Han hanging on his wall. But unlike in the parable, Jabba can't kill Luke, and instead, Luke ends up killing his rancor. Later, when Luke escapes execution at the last possible moment, we see him take the role of the landlord in the parable. He emerges as something older and more powerful than before. We see the Jedi return, much like the landlord in the parable. To set things straight, we get the wailing of a lightsaber and gnashing of teeth. Luke repeatedly warns Jabba about what it will cost him if he does not make a deal with him. Just as in the Gospels, Jesus warns about what will happen to the tenants who don't pay their rent. You can either profit by this, or be destroyed. It's your choice, but I warn you not to underestimate my power. You should have bargained, Jabba. Jabba, this is your last chance. Free us, 
or die. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Now, Leia ends up killing Jabba, which I guess does not go along with the parable, but it does bring to mind the popular depiction of Mary crushing the serpent, Satan sometimes called the old worm. This might sound like a stretch, but really, how else do you make sense of this nonsensical plan? I really don't understand it. Now, I told all this to my lovely wife, and she did not buy it. It had been a while since she saw the movie, so I explained to her that most fans recognize this plan makes no sense, and that my explanation makes it work on a certain level. She got that, but she had a much more simple explanation for why Lucas wrote it this way. This script gets Princess Leia into a metal bikini. At first, I kind of fought this one, because I had come up with such a thoroughly constructed, archetypical explanation that jived well with the theme of the movie Return of the Jedi, Return of the Landlord, to bring justice to the tenants who have ignored his repeated requests for what they owe him. But it only took a few moments for me to come around on this idea. It makes a lot of sense, provides a much more elegant and straightforward explanation, and, as I hinted at the beginning of this video, it actually gets to one of the biggest questions in science fiction. Sci-fi writer L. Sprague de Camp once said, quote, There has been a great deal of talk about the big questions of science fiction. The truly big question of science fiction is, What is that woman in a brass brassiere doing on the cover of my book? Unquote. Anyone familiar with the covers of old pulp sci-fi novels will recognize this trope. Many of them had scantily clad women decorating them. Why? To answer to Camp's question, well, look at the target audience of science fiction back then. It consisted mostly of adolescent boys, so having women in metal brassiers on the cover definitely plays to that demographic. The sci-fi audience has widened since then, but adolescent and adolescent-minded males still make up a huge part of it. So that might explain why Lucas went with this plot. Getting everyone captured gives an excuse to put Leia in a metal bikini. We know that in the original Star Wars, Lucas would not let Carrie Fisher wear a bra. He claimed there was no underwear in space, at least not in a galaxy far, far away. Though, I guess they do have bikinis. In any case, in the original Star Wars, Lucas insisted on using gaffer's tape to give Carrie Fisher support. So, given this fact, it does not seem at all far-fetched to suggest Lucas concocted this plot solely to create a scenario in which Leia wears a metal bikini. Although, if he did write this script solely to get Fisher into a metal bikini, he must have done it before considering the motion picture rating system of the time. Because in order to keep a PG rating, Lucas had to use gaffer's tape to reduce the amount of cleavage the outfit showed. On the left, we see Fisher without gaffer's tape, and on the right, we see her with the gaffer's tape. Or at least, that is what a bunch of articles and Star Wars message boards say. I have not dug too deep into the claim, so take it with at least a grain of salt. Wow. I did not think when I started writing the script I would end up talking so much about Carrie Fisher's tits, but here we are. Now, you might find both of these explanations ridiculous, but really, how else do you explain this plan? Do these explanations sound any more ridiculous than a plan to rescue someone that requires three more of your heroes to get captured first when you could have more easily pulled off the rescue without doing this? I mean, I mean come on, this plan makes no sense whatsoever. All right, in any case, thanks for watching, folks. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you really like what I do, please contribute to my Patreon or make a PayPal donation. I also have some t-shirts for sale. They feature the major arcana of the tarot deck that you find decorating my channel. For this video, I have used the Magician. They are available in different colors and in unisex and women's tees. I recently gave the shirts a redesign that looks a lot better than the old ones, so check them out. I have links in the description. I'm Greg Belvedere. Remember, all generalizations are stupid. So never speak in absolutes. See you next time.